Hello, I'm Cora Kozets, Head of Communities at eLife. It's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to our May's ECR Wednesday webinar. This series aims to give early career researchers a platform to discuss issues important to you and your research career. You can follow us on Twitter at eLife Community uh, and with the hashtag uh, ECR Wednesday. The session is being recorded and will make it available on YouTube in the near future. Now it's my pleasure to invite Hedia Ibrahimi, a postdoctoral researcher at the Heron University of Medical Sciences, Iran, and a member of the ELIF Early Career Advisory Group to introduce today's session and our panelists. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Cora, and hello. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our Early Career Researcher Wednesday webinar. Uh, I am in, I'm Hedi Ebrahimi. I am an ELIF Early Career Advisory Group member, and I will be moderating today's session. Uh, just a few words about our today's host. ELIF is a nonprofit organization that is operating a platform to improve all aspects of research communication by encouraging and respecting, recognizing the most responsible behavior in research. Uh, the role of Early Career Advisory Group is to influence and support ELIF's work to catalyze broad reform in the evaluation and communication of science, and in particular, to represent the needs and aspiration of researchers at early stages in their career. For a research, a culture that is healthy for science and for scientists. Today, our webinar panelists will talk about the process of preprinting in clinical and health research, consideration ensuring results that, is, that are specific to medicine, as well as career implication of releasing your work early. Uh, let me start with a little housekeeping. Uh, during the webinar, please be honest, respectful, inclusive, accommodating, appreciated and open to learn from everyone else. Do not attack, demean, disrupt, harass, or threaten others or encourage such behaviors. If you feel uncomfortable or unwelcome on any of these webinars, please contact at eLive, contact eLive via mail uh, at eLive-safety-team uh, at protomail.com. We reserve the right to ask anyone to leave and or deny access to a subsequent webinar. As Cora mentioned, the session will be recorded and we will make it available through our YouTube channel. And if you not need help, please send a chat message directly to Cora Korzak or Shane. Following the presentation, we will relink your question to our panelists. To ask question at any point during the webinar, you can type your question into Zoom's chat box. And you can also tweet us. We are at ELI community. Please use hashtag ECR Wednesday. Uh, I will read out your name and a question in the QA at the end of the webinar. And I and now I would like to welcome our speakers. Uh, first of all, uh, welcome Dr. Joseph Ross. Dr. Ross is a professor of general internal medicine at Yale Medical, uh, Yale School of Medicine and associate uh, physician of Center for Outcome Research and Evaluation at uh, Yale New Haven Health System. He also uh, has co-founded the preprint server Medarchive and is currently the US Outreach uh, and Research Editor at BMJ. Welcome Dr. Ross, the scene is here. Thank you, Hedy, and I'm delighted to be here and looking forward to the conversation and questions over the course of the session. Um, I just have a few slides that I put together just to sort of set the tone for how uh, preprints in medicine are being used. Shane, if you want to go to the slideshow. Um, as I'm waiting to come up, the... Um, so uh, MedArchive, which uh, is a, is a preprint platform that we launched uh, for health sciences preprints. It's uh, built on top of the same infrastructure of a preprint platform that many of you guys are probably familiar with, um, BioArchive, which is a preprint platform for the basic sciences. Um, I'm assuming everyone kind of knows what a preprint is. Uh, the you know a preprint is like an early 
uh, version of your work that has not yet undergone peer review that you're ready to share with the research community to tell people about your results. So we felt there was a real need for this in the, in the medical and clinical sciences community. MedArchive itself is a not-for-profit entity. It's a service to the community, not a product. It's publisher ne neutral, and it's currently operated by the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, which is based in the United States. But it's managed in partnership with BMJ and Yale. And we launched this platform in the second quarter of 2019. We did not know that COVID was coming. <laughs> um, after really a long, you know, probably uh, 12 to 18 months of preparation where we were working together to try to identify all the ways to make sure that both the scientists could share their work early, but it would not have, um, you know, put patient care or public health at risk because there's obviously a lot of concerns about sharing preliminary uh, clinical research. Next slide. We wanted to set this platform up because uh, we think there are really important potential benefits to using preprints in medicine. First, it enables the, oh, you went really far, Shane. Could you go back a few slides? Yeah. Uh, oh, okay, so I see, so it's not, it's not, uh, um, it, it enables the rapid early sharing of new information. This is important because it establishes the providence of ideas, providence of ideas while papers are being peer reviewed. It facilitates awareness, prompts scientific feedback, enhances collaboration among scientists, and it demonstrates scientific productivity, which is really clear, cl clearly important for early stage researchers. I think it's also quite important because it makes less, what I call less publishable studies more readily available. We know that it takes a much longer time for medical education and qualitative research to make its way through peer review and into the literature. Same is true for quality improvement and healthcare delivery innovation studies as well as for studies that are confirmatory or contradictory to other things, you know, results that are being published and even negative or inconclusive research findings. But all of these findings are really important to share and to share right away, particularly quality improvement and healthcare delivery innovation research. The idea that we're doing innovations and not reporting the results for several years is, is really uh, backwards to me. I also think that Using preprints, it fosters more complete results reporting. This promotes research transparency, particularly you know, for those of us who go to scientific conferences, right? And we present our abstracts at these meetings, perhaps with a larger poster that has more detail. Wouldn't it be terrific if you could actually preprint your work at the same time so you can send somebody to a full, uh, you know, a full paper uh, when, you're, when you're presenting your finding? I also think you know there, it complements trial registry results reporting, which is really bare bones, but provides sort of core data, allows you to explain what happened in the study and anything that happened between protocol development and study completion. And it also enables you to link protocol sensitivity analysis and supplementary materials, which not all journals publish. So it puts everything in one spot. Next slide. There are also, you know, concerns and perceived risks. You know, when we were getting ready to launch this platform, we heard a lot from many different groups of editors about the potential harm to the public that wrong information would get out there, would be magnified by media reporting. There's this issue around what they call persistent preprints, where the results and conclusions are changed through the course of peer review, but these old versions uh, sit up there. There's a lot of worry about the manipulation of preprint platforms by commercial interests, and of course about undermining established medical communication norms through peer review journals, through conferences, through trial registries. Um, but inevitably, when we talked to authors about our, the idea for the preprint platform, they had only one single worry. Would journals not publish our papers if we preprinted? Because otherwise we're on board, we like it, we want our work to get out there more rapidly, we want to enable more people to see it. Next slide. So when we launched MedArchive back in June 2019, we actually tried to establish a platform that mitigated many of the concerns and risks uh, that we heard from editors. So we have very clear submission requirements for authors. You have to submit the names of all the people involved, their affiliations. We require a trial registration for clinical trials. We require a statement of ethical oversight for all studies. Uh, and other, and we you know suggest the use of like reporting checklists from consort and, and the like, uh, and we even enable data sharing if people want to do that. So we we tried to put a sort of system in place to you know, for the more responsible dissemination of of people's research. We also have very clear posting criteria. MedArchive is for research articles only. It's not for commentaries. It's not for viewpoints. It's not for narrative reviews. 
It's not for editorials, right? If it's a scientific study, this can be any type of scientific study. It can be a clinical trial. It can be a retrospective analysis. It can be a qualitative study. It can be a Delphi process, but it, it has to be a scientific study. Systematic reviews, meta-analyses, those count too. And even if it's a data paper or a methods paper, those count as well. If you're writing a paper to explain to people the data source you're making available, that qualifies. We established a screening process so that every paper is looked at by multiple people to make sure that nothing sort of gets through that could be potentially, uh, you know, uh, put public health at risk. Uh, and we also signal the need for caution when scientists and non-scientists read and review our, the preprints on the platform. If you go to the page, you'll see there's, you know, big bold writing that says, you know, this is a preprint. What is this? You know, don't, don't report it in the media, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. We, we launched in July of 2019. Um, obviously, we couldn't have anticipated what was about to happen across the globe. But it, and our platform ended up being a real repository for a huge amount of COVID-related research, and our platform has steadily grown. You can see, you know, at the beginning, you know, we were getting 100 or so new papers, then 200 or so new papers each month, um, sort of going along. And then um, 2020 hit, and the, the platform exploded to the point where. You know, we were getting, you know, at, at the peak in May, um, 77 daily submissions of new preprints submitted to the platform. That includes weekends, um, you know, every day, you know, 75 new papers, 75 new papers. So, so it really became the repository. And after a little bit of a dip through the summer, it's picked back up. And now we're, we're, we're somewhere between 60 to 70 a day, uh, which is terrific. It's, it's really growing steadily. Next slide. Just to show you that um, our, now, that when I last, when I put the slide together, that we had more than 1,200 papers. I think it's actually more than 1,500 now. I'm sorry, I didn't have a chance to update the slides in advance of this. Um, about 3,500 of these papers are have been revised. So we allow for authors to update their preprints um, over time. So if you you know do revise your analyses or do change the way um, you know, you're presenting your results either in response to peer reviewers or somebody seeing your work on the, on the platform. It, it's a really a straightforward process to up, upload a new version and the history of versions uh, is saved on the site. And also just to say about 20% of submissions are being rejected. Lots of case reports, case studies and editorials had come to our site that, that obviously we weren't posting. And, and there were some that we uh, decided it would be better not to post uh, and that the, instead it would, should go through peer review first. So, you know, this was, we were particularly sensitive to this in the, uh, you know, during the pandemic and with lots of, um, let's just say speculative research being done on new therapies and, and whatnot. This is what our, uh, next slide, this is what our platform looks like. Um, so here's a page of an article that was posted actually early in the pandemic. You can see the title, the author is right there. You can see that language. I told you this article is a preprint and not been peer reviewed. It includes the abstract, a link to the PDF, uh, and, and, and what more. Um, you can see it next uh, click. You can see the link to all the blog posts uh, that we've uh, found that, that talk about the preprint so that you can see how others are discussing the study. Uh, click. You can see um, a link to a com the, all the comments that are made directly on the site, which can be short comments, they can be scientific comments and peer review like comments. And uh, click and click, you can see that it link, uh, sorry, the, the animation's not directly lined up, but you can see that the, the link to the comments is right at the top so that people can go right there and then click again. Uh, this is just to tell you that about 8% of uh, papers have uh, preprints have comments on it. And about a third of them are tweeted about. There's a every tweet, every paper is actually automatically tweeted. But about we when we track through and look at samples, we see about a third are discussed on Twitter um, by the authors or others, uh, not just the auto Twitter. And then you can see there's a link uh, to the metrics page, which shows you how often uh, the article has been used, the abstract's been downloaded, and the PDF's been downloaded. Next one. Um, thus far, about 10% of papers have been posted uh, that have been up on our platform for more than a month have been published. This is steadily going up in lots and lots of journals. Just to show you, there's been 670 unique journals. Uh, next slide, uh, just to show you that you can see in our, in our site, we directly link to the publication that, that in red, um, the, if you click again, you'll see uh, under the, the, the DOI, we link directly to the paper when it's identified. We have a crawler that, that goes through to try to find it matching on the authors 
in the titles. If somebody submits a preprint and they don't see um, what uh, they don't see their paper there linked, they can just tell us and, and we'll put it up. And next slide, you can just this is just a paper that linked to a study in the New England Journal. So it just makes it very easy. And I think those were all the slides I had. Uh, just a sort of background about MedArchive, and I'm happy to answer any questions when we get to that part of the session. So thank you again for having me. Well, that's great. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Uh, that was wonderful. Uh, up next is Dr. Philippa Matthews. Uh, Dr. Matthews is a consultant in clinical infection and associate professor based at the University of Oxford, United Kingdom, and a research, research flow in clinical infection founded by Welcome Trust. Uh, Dr. Matthews leads research into hepatitis B infection and, uh, and has been heavily involved in translational research during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Dr. Matthews also is an affiliate of MedArchive. Welcome, Dr. Matthews. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. And um, it's, it's great to, to be able to address this, um, this topic, which is close to my heart. So let me just get my slide deck up. Um, so thanks for the for the introduction. Um, I won't repeat um, all of that, but we'll just headline myself as why archive. So um, some some kind of perspectives from the from the research um, and and clinical perspective on this. Um, and to say I am an affiliate for Med Archive, which means that I help as a volunteer. <laughs> thanks, Joe. Um, in in screening um, and sort of discussions around some of the work that gets posted there, but this is a, a voluntary role, so I don't have any stake in Med Archive, and I, I'm really coming to this as a sort of Im impartial um, comment commentator. Um, so th thanks again for joining. Um, so as a kind of mid-career researcher, I think sort of coming into the um, the, the research um, arena, there's often this kind of desperate fear about sort of impact factor, rate of publication, this kind of awful um, sense about publish or perish. And of course, you know, short funding periods typical in the early and mid career research um, phases and the market ever more competitive. So that stress sort of seems in a way to be compounded by um, by the, the COVID situation. And of course, it's often a phase in our lives when we're dealing um, as clinicians with ongoing clinical responsibilities and training needs um, and also managing a work life balance. So many people have caring responsibilities or other commitments outside work, um, which makes um, life complicated. <laughs> um, we've looked at the, the impact factor beast. Um, of course, the peer review system can be regarded as a beast as well. Um, it doesn't always function in, in the way that we'd like it to. Um, it, it's can take a long time, it can be very unpredictable. And of course, again, all of this is compounded by the situation of the pandemic. And a while ago, I made this slide kind of thinking about, well, you know, why do time delays matter in publication? And I think there's a few reasons. I mean, you can laugh about this by saying we're all a lot older by the end of a project, but it kind of matters because life goes on and 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 making progress and getting uh, getting up the career ladder kind of makes a difference. Everyone is cross. Um, it, really what I'm alluding to here is it's difficult to kind of keep a team potentially together. You want to um, apply for new funding, you want to make progress and people get bored and tired and um, despairing about getting things published. Sometimes you feel that by the time you actually get something into print, the data have actually been superseded and there's no room for updates in the conventional uh, models of publishing. And as I've said, really, it can be very hard to move on with next steps, whether that's applying for a new post, applying for a new grant, um, uh, uh, applying to start a new project. It's very difficult when you still feel that you've got things that are, are open ended and unpublished. So this is not a small problem in the conventional um, pathway to academic publication. So I, for one, was really delighted and embraced all of this kind of wealth of preprint opportunities that have come out really in the last few years. Um, and actually, it's you know reflecting on this really interesting, I think, where I had colleagues who, who just felt this was sort of an utterly unthinkable thing to do to share to share work in the public domain before it's been peer reviewed and published. And now this is just a very widely accepted pathway, um, which makes life, I think, undoubtedly better for all of us. So this isn't an exhausted, an exhaustive list of options, but it, it's some of the ways that you can can share work um, prior to peer review publication. 
Um, of course, alongside the, um, the, the acceptance by the scientific community came acceptance by funders, which was absolutely critical, I think. So as I'm funded by Wellcome and, and the trust said in 2017 that they would formally um, recognize preprints as part of um, grant applications and end of, uh, end of review reports. Um, for the UK, the UK Research Institutes and the Medical Research Council um, followed suit very soon after, and this is now um, widely accepted. And when I look at my own CV, so I've just been applying for the equivalent of senior fellowship positions, and actually about 10% of my publications are preprints. And of course, these are the ones that are newest and that might be most relevant, most significant in terms of actually underpinning my own application. So this makes a really huge difference. And of course, the percentage of your publications that might be in this category varies according to the stage of your career and all sorts of things. But um, that 10% to me is, is really crucial in terms of advancements. Um, also interesting, I think, and, and really kind of epitomized by the last year is the fact that this is a way of communicating work with the mass media. So here are two examples from the UK, very different um, kind of news um, uh, agencies sharing this work but you know very clearly and stating this is on med archive this is the guardian the study which is published on med archive and they give you a link so that you can click on that and it takes you directly into the um, journals page uh, the mail online aims at a very different audience very different demographic reading this but you know likewise um, loud and clear referencing um, med archive and indeed the, the this paper that's um, written about in the mail online has, has subsequently been published in nature um, so it actually reaches a mass audience in a way that I think would have been very unusual a few years ago um, and is absolutely crucial uh, uh, in the in times of, of the pandemic situation. Um, I've taken a real interest in preprinting for fairness. So some of you will be aware of this acronym about fair publishing, which says that your work should aspire to be findable, accessible, interoperable and reproducible. Um, and I think particularly for um, uh, the, the preprint literature, making a work findable and accessible is, is absolutely, those boxes are absolutely ticked by this model. Um, and indeed, as I think Joe has mentioned about MedArchive, in fact, being able to kind of share your data, share, surf, share full methods, share supplements and so on, also ticks the other two boxes. So in terms of a kind of um, moral and uh, 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 a laudable way to, to publish and share data, this really does tick the boxes. I've also actually written about this myself and thought about FAIR, in, in, not as the acronym, but just as a, a, a thought about sort of equity and justice and actually thinking about how we should make scientific publishing FAIR to the people who participate in research, to our patients, um, who both may be participants, but also may benefit from, from results being shared and disseminated and available. Um, to our funders who pour money into biomedical research, to our educational institutes, to clinical and academic teams within which we function, and also to a global community which is very diverse. And a lot of my research work is conducted with partners in low and middle income countries. Um, if you think about that context, then, then access to some of the platforms and the publishers who charge vast fees for publishing papers is, is totally out of the question. So actually, when you think about um, uh, equity in publishing, uh, I would also say that preprints um, are really able to kind of support these, these um, questions. Preprinting for health, um, as Joe says, there's always been this kind of fine line to be trod between sharing research early while also not disseminating results that are potentially misleading or haven't been thoroughly scrutinized. Um, but certainly being able to share methods, giving the potential to pool data sets, um, allowing this kind of open and transparent discussion of results. Um, there's an interesting question around duplication, isn't there? Because on the one hand, you could say um, preprints help us to avoid duplication. You can see if someone else has done a study and avoid duplicating the exact same thing yourself. But actually, it also um, underpins necessary attempts at duplication, whereby the scientific community can really see if something is robust and um, stands up to scrutiny by deliberately duplicating um, efforts to see if they can gain the same um, results. And of course, opportunities for collaboration, um, transparency and demonstrating progress. Um, so one example um, that I think is interesting from the COVID um, era is this kind of dialogue about hydroxychloroquine, um, which of course was widely raised as a kind of, you know, miracle um, cure or, or prophylactic for um, COVID-19. Uh, which has subsequently been kind of convincingly overturned. 
Um, but having these um, many studies available, um, you can look, you can see 948 results on MedArchive if you search for COVID hydroxychloroquine. Um, and actually this nice comment on Newsweek by some scientists saying, you know, science is not infallible. A large number of studies did suggest that this was um, a, an interesting drug that might have benefits and then had to be withdrawn. And doesn't that dialogue um, get sort of expanded and amplified and, and having it in the public domain and keeping it transparent um, must be to, to the collective benefits of all of us. And so just to finish with, I'm going to give you two examples of papers that I myself have pre-printed in a pandemic. So um, I work on mainly hepatitis B virus, although not for the last year, but that, this is my, my main um, research interest. And um, it's a neglected disease. Um, it doesn't have a lot of advocacy and it's very slow typically to publish papers. And of course, in the middle of a pandemic, trying to publish on hepatitis B is, you know, nigh on impossible. Um, but to be able to put work um, onto a preprint server means that we've you know, been able to um, share it with our community um, and, and move on to the next stages of the project really successfully. Uh, this is another example, something contrasting that I was involved in in antibody testing for COVID-19. And this was a big multi, uh, multi center uh, collaborative effort done very fast early in the pandemic. And this was slow to get through peer review um, for the opposite reason. So it was such a political hot potato that it jumped between multiple journals and for, for various political reasons, uh, didn't get picked up right away for publication. And if you look at the metrics here, I'm quite proud of my hepatitis B work being tweeted by 10 people and a thousand people looking at the abstract, which is, you know, orders of magnitude higher than it would have been because um, it's still not in it quite in print. We're nearly there now uh, in, a, in a peer review journal. But um, I've got, you know, I've got an, an audience of a thousand that otherwise would have not been accessible. And I've been able to put this on my CV and put it into grant applications and so on. Um, meanwhile, our um, our uh, article about COVID antibody testing is, um, I can't, uh, I'm, I'm covered up here, but uh, 99,000 uh, downloads of the PDF from MedArchive. Um, and, and I think about 70,000 of those were before it got into a, a peer review journal. So uh, 70,000 full PDF downloads just shows what a big audience you're potentially reaching. Um, of course, there are still downsides. Um, the ground is still moving here. You do have to think carefully about what you might submit where. Um, I would still recommend careful discussions around co-authors. Um, think about why people don't agree to share their work on a preprint server and uh, what the barriers might be. Uh, there's some concern about receiving negative comments, but actually this is a forum for really good thorough feedback, which actually makes um, work better at the end of the day. Um, people are hugely anxious about their work being scooped. And I've always said this is actually an anti-scoop mechanism, right? You've got your work out there. It's in the public domain. It's date stamped with a DOI. There you go. It's not going to be scooped because it's got your name on it already. Um, is there a loss of quality? Well, maybe, but there are plenty of poor quality articles that get into peer reviewed journals and actually people police themselves. So, so you know, good, good work gets lots of citations and, and metrics and so on. And the community does police itself. There is lack of control around timing. So this is a problem for a small minority of papers, but I've come up against this with COVID work where you know sometimes you want to be able to make a press release and there's concern around the timing. And um, uh, I guess this is still for, for dialogue with, with Joe and others involved in MedArchive. Um, but typically the, 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 the turnaround times are short um, and some limitations around eligible material as Joe has already discussed. So um, there are limitations of what you can put on med archive, but actually there are lots of other diverse um, options for sharing other kinds of work. Um, so if it won't go on med archive, you can undoubtedly find um, another site for it. Um, so I'll finish there. And basically the idea is that we get impact factor back on a leash. Um, so thanks to the, the uh, archive community um, and to Eli for organising, and I'll also be very happy to uh, engage in discussions and questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Matthews. Oh, that, that was great, very informative. Thank you so much. And that's promising that we are hearing that 10% of your funding, your research are publishing as a preprint first. That's great. Thank you. And while we are waiting for Dr. Jeremy Fast, uh, we are going to ask some of the questions that we received. Uh, so I will start with them. Uh, so the first question is, 
For everyone, uh, what is the process by which submissions are rejected? Who decides and is there an appeal process? Philippa, maybe I'll start with that and then I can turn to you as an affiliate and you can describe your role. But so when a, when a paper comes into MedArchive, just like to BioArchive, it goes through sort of standard uh, administrative checking, you know, was everything submitted that needed to be? Was, if it's a clinical trial, was it registered? Does it have a clinical trial registration number? Is there an ethical oversight statement and all that stuff? And the staff will actually return a lot of papers going back and forth to make sure all the required materials are there. There's no formatting requirements, but there's information that has to be part of every submission. They're also looking to make sure that it's a it's a an article that fits, you know, is it a research article? You know, somebody else asked in the chat, you know, why are so many not being posted? Uh, and it's important to say that we're posting them, we're not publishing them. Um, and so many are not being posted because they're they don't fit our criteria. They're case reports or case studies, which we don't allow, uh, mostly because of concerns around um, our ability to understand uh, whether patients gave informed consent. Uh, and there's a lot, often a lot of patient identification within a case report. That's better for a journal to have to manage. Um, but also, you know, editorials or narrative reviews or like guidelines and recommendation statements. We say, you know, there are places for those, but it, MedArchive is not it. We're a research uh, platform. So somebody submits, it goes through. Uh, once it goes through the administrative staff, it goes to our affiliates. And Philippa can talk about what that's like. But essentially, somebody takes a look at the paper and it just says, you know, does it quack like a duck, walk like a duck? You know, like, does it look like a duck? Like, is it a research paper? They're not reading it. They're not peer reviewing it. They're not looking to see if it's right or wrong. They're just trying to make sure, yes, this is a report of a scientific study. If anybody has any concerns or flags it for any reason, you know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a study that's reporting, you know, some new adverse event from the COVID vaccine, like, you know, that there's a high rate of seizures. We, we might not want that to immediately get out and be spread around the media. We might think, you know, so what someone should really make sure that this is right and should go through peer review first, or we should at least have a discussion of it among our oversight board. But if we do um, not uh, post a paper or reject the posting of a paper, of course you can appeal. Um, and we'll have a discussion and we'll explain our logic to it. But um, Philippa, I don't know if you wanna talk about what it's like as an affiliate you know, and seeing a, a, a queue of 50 papers that need to be reviewed and how you think about it. Yeah, it's, I've, I've definitely been aware of the, the increase over the last year, so, some of which are mine, of course. Um, and I should say, actually, just just while, I, while I've got the floor, um, it's not that 10% of all my research goes on to MedArchive, 100% of my research goes on to MedArchive. It's just that at any given moment, as a cross section, about 10% of of all my of all my papers, as it were, are still in the preprint phase. So it kind of that's just to sort of give you a sense of that that ratio. But actually, I'm putting I would say I'm putting 100% of my of my papers onto onto a preprint platform. Um, to answer the question about um, my experience, I would say what what Joe said is it sort of largely reflects my role. Indeed, so I take a, a look to see does this have a title that looks like an academic paper. Um, does it have a set of authors with affiliations that look um, reasonable? And then you can very quickly see by looking at the kind of the data and the results and so on that that this is the kind of paper that would be that would be posted here. I have on a very few occasions been asked to look at take a special look at something um, uh, which has been flagged for a query, um, as Joe says, which is part of that discussion around is this appropriate for us to put out into the preprint domain without peer review. And then there would be, I think, several of us involved in a discussion about whether there was potential harm in um, disseminating something. And there's a, you know, a variety of kind of metrics that you might look at around, you know, where it's come from, who's written it, why it's, why it's um, been written, and, and what kind of data are are, are in there. Um, and so there's a few things I've been involved in where we've we've made a decision that it shouldn't be posted on the on the preprint site. Um. Thank you, and thank you for clarification, Dr. Matthews. Um, we have a question from Alexandra. I think we you had answered most of the part, uh, and just this part uh, I can ask, how do you know that, I think it's for Dr. Ross, uh, how do you know that others won't post elsewhere without undergoing peer review first, uh, as you suggest? Uh, is this something you are monitoring? 
Yeah, th that, that we there's definitely been uh, papers, articles that have been submitted to our platform where we're concerned about it being posted. And then we later see that it shows up on another preprint platform. And of course, there's nothing we can do about that, right? I mean, we can only, you know, enforce the rules that we think we're doing. We think that we've set up this platform in a way that benefits particularly authors, but also, you know, provide some of those safeguards uh, for the, the broader scientific and research community. The only thing, you know, the I would just tell everyone that if you see a paper on our platform or elsewhere that you have concerns about, leave a comment. That's actually the most important and effective thing. And I think that's like, first, the first step is getting people to post their work, um, which is great and it's happening. Philip has talked about it. Jeremy's gonna talk about it in a second, the value that comes with posting. But the second is like now using the platform as a really a means of engaging in discussion through Twitter, leaving comments, letting people know if you see a paper that's flawed. I, I, my hope is that we can soon get to the point where we're posting everything because people are actively commenting and saying, oh, I wouldn't believe this paper because of A, B, or C, um, and, and really making it a forum. Uh, but when people take a paper that we won't post to take it elsewhere, there's not there's not much we can do. Um, great, thank you. Um, we have another question from Alexandra, and I think uh, both of our panelists can answer that. Uh, is there any exclusion uh, from, a screen, for example, uh, do you uh, screen all of the preprints uh, by academic in the field, or there is a certain type of papers that you are just a screen? Um, the way it's set up, Philippa may not realize this, but there, there's outside of the sort of special reach outs to individual affiliates everyone screens anything. And, and that's why it's really just a broad, like, you know, does it look like a scientific paper? Because some people are expert in particular types of research. Maybe they're, you know, expert modelers, uh, but they're working with us and volunteering their time as affiliates and they see a big cohort study. Well, does it look like a cohort study? Are they, you know, we're, we're just asking for the really the basics as, as they're taking a look at it. Yeah, so yeah, just to endorse that really. So I, I can see a queue of papers when I log in as an affiliate and I tend to just kind of, you know, work work through them in order. Occasionally, if there's something where I think, actually, I, I don't I don't feel kind of expert to to take a judgment on this, then I, then I might kind of flag that. But broadly speaking, it's just, does this look like a bona fide piece of scientific research? Great, thank you. Uh, the other question, not this was said for which panelists. Uh, so is there any difference between studies conducted in underdeveloped countries versus developed countries in terms of posting their work on preprint servers? Um, could you say that again, Hedge? Uh, did you say is there is there a, uh, any like differences a... between studies conducted in underrepresented countries or developed countries in posting? No, their... no, and I, we we are hopeful that the platform is a good place for for research from underdeveloped countries because sometimes that work is harder to publish if it's smaller in scale or maybe there are other concerns because it was less resource as a study, so that for for whatever reason. But, but it still needs to have ethical oversight. It still needs to have meet all the same requirements. But otherwise, there's, there's, no, there's no difference between you know, articles submitted from different countries or other parts of the world. It does have to be written in English. That is the only uh, sort of formatting requirement we, that we do impose. And uh, that's my question about the statistics. Do you know how uh, many of the preprints posted on Med Archives are coming from? developed countries such as North America, Europe, and how about how this is statistic work, for example, for Asia, Africa, South America? Um, I can look it up while Jeremy is giving his presentation and then I can come back to it. Thank you. Uh, our next question. Uh, so, I think we, I can see that Dr. Fast has joined us. Uh, Fast, uh, welcome. Dr. Fast is an instructor at Harvard Medical School and attending physician in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. He's also editor-in-chief of brief19.com. 
Hello, can you can you all hear me? Great. Thanks for having me. Sorry I'm late. Had a conflict um, with some media people. Anyway, let me um, let me dive into a screen share. Um, uh, the hardest part of screen share is always finding the right screen to share. So just bear with me for just a second while I like go through my hundred different screens. Um, uh, keynote. There it is. Nope, that's wrong. Great. Um, so is that is it? Can you can you all see that? Great. Um, so again, thanks for having me. Sorry I'm late. It's um, uh, excuse me. I hope it's not redundant uh, to anything that's been said. It sounds like you're having a really great conversation. Um, but I just want to kind of use the opportunity to talk through a couple of case studies and to think aloud about uh, preprints and action. And example of one case where we 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 saw preprints and it made a huge difference. And famously, I think, and an example of the opposite. Um, and then talk through my own experience and a little bit of a journey because I've I've really come around on this. I was not necessarily like on the uh, preprint uh, bandwagon until you know about a year ago. So here we go. Um, this is I think this is the sort of the case study for everyone um, looking at why preprints matter. It, this is the, the the recovery trial uh, out of the UK um, doing great science during the pandemic, and you know just thousands and thousands of, of, of participants in this study. And on June 22nd, well, actually on June 17th, there was a press release that basically said, by the way, um, dexamethasone, the steroid that's inexpensive, that's in most hospitals all over the world, has a mortality benefit for treating COVID-19, which is the first therapeutic of any kind, novel or existing, to have a mortality benefit. But they put in a press release, which sort of, you know, it's hard to deal with that. So everyone was demanding, demanding a preprint. I'd never heard that before. We, we have to see the data. So five days later, they put out the preprint. And this is the, the sort of infamous or famous, beautiful um, uh, graphs from the preprint from the recovery group in the UK, really showing that especially, especially or really only in patients with oxygen requirements or who need mechanical ventilation, uh, dexamethasone has a mortality benefit compared to usual care. So that's the third and fourth panel, are C and D. And in fact, the opposite was true, um, maybe a signal towards harm among patients who did not need a oxygen. So this, this sort of immediately was practice changing in June of, of last year. I, I mean, personally, as a frontline doctor, I was not going to let a hypoxic patient pass in front of me without being highly considered or almost automatically considered for dexamethasone. And this is based on a preprint. So changing practice. And I think it really does um, kind of add on to what was just said, which is that, you know, th these are group groups who are well known for, and the methods are very, you know, transparent. So it's better than a press release by far. So it's nice to have that. So then you think of June 22nd, but it really took three or four weeks until the New England Journal of Medicine published this. So it's July 19th, um, was the first publication of the recovery data. And you'll recognize the figure. And I just want to point this out, that we waited three or four weeks where some people who are waiting for the peer review version, they're waiting for the definitive proof that the, the preprint's not enough. But just look side by side of these two figures, because that's the point of preprints, is data are data. And when you see good methods or you see bad methods, the data are the data. So either there's good methods and the data are true or there's bad methods and the data are unreliable. So if you look at this study and you read it carefully, you realize that it's a, not a perfect study. It's an open label study. It's not randomized controlled. It's not randomized placebo uh, controlled it's, it, or blinded. It's randomized open label, but nevertheless, thousands of patients, huge mortality benefit. And what did the New England Journal really add to this? Well, you can notice that they um, they put usual care on top instead of on bottom on, in, in, the, uh, in the formatting. You can see that panel B is now panel C, and that's it. That, that is literally the difference, is that they, they, they did some nice uh, adjusting of the order of which the data was presented, and um, the font is different, and that's really literally it. And so for a month, you had doctors who were sort of scared of preprints not giving dexamethasone because uh, it wasn't in the right font, basically. So I just think that's uh, unfortunate. Um, by the way, I, no one's ever going to be able to tell this. This is a classic example of, of sort of cherry picking. But right around the time that the preprint came out, um, the cases went up, but there was actually a dip in mortality. I'll never know if people were, if this is because of anything. But I always find that interesting that cases kept going up, but actually um, there was a there was actually a little bit of a decrease in mortality. Was that the, was that preprint saving lives? I, I don't know, but it's certainly uh, something I noticed. 
Um, now the opposite uh, situation is something that should have been preprinted, wasn't preprinted, and wow, would a lot of embarrassment have been saved had it not been preprinted, had it been preprinted. So this is the hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine in a um, with and without a macrolide in a huge, supposedly a huge multinational regional uh, registry analysis done by a group that no one had heard of called Surgisphere. And they were apparently uh, had hundreds and hundreds of hospitals reporting COVID data to them, not pre-printed. And I just want to point out, this is from a blog that I, I helped to run, one of the podcasts. You know, there's a lot of problems with this study, okay? Like there was no track record from these people who, who studied it, which again, it's not, you know, I don't really care about that. I, if it's good science, it's good science. But but that was like sort of like the, the, the tip of the iceberg. If, if everything else lines up, then you can just say, great, they're just doing good science in a place you haven't heard of. But the problem was they don't list the hospitals who are participants. And they, they, they basically, the, the data is really, really shrouded. You can't really see direct data. And so an open letter was sent from a bunch of physicians and scientists all over the world, basically to the authors, to Lancet saying, look, we don't understand. There's no ethics review in this paper. We don't know which hospitals uh, were in the data sets. We don't understand why there's more deaths in Australia in this study than have been reported for the whole country of Australia during this period. That seems odd. Um, that doesn't have any face validity. There, were, there was data from Africa that was basically almost impossible to imagine that was true because you need sophisticated emergency, you need uh, electronic medical records to basically sync. And they were acting as if this was happening in real time. No one had ever heard of it. But you know, the, 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 the reviewers at Lancet didn't catch it. Uh, one of the big things I thought was so fascinating was that the confidence intervals were actually a big tell. In the confidence intervals for the data, the confidence intervals were too narrow to be appropriate for the data they had. And so someone on the internet, uh, actually Columbia University, was blogging about this. Like, wait a second, if, if you can reverse engineer what they really found from their confidence intervals, and it looks like kids are dying more than adults of this disease. We know that's not true. So basically you had a peer review process happening after Lancet published this thing, but the public was doing it. I'll skip through this. Um, and so here's the open letter. And that was on May 28th. So look, let's go back for a second. Uh, May 22nd, Lancet puts it out there. May 28th, there's this open letter that has a listing of all these problems. Uh, on June 3rd, um, Lancet says, yeah, we're concerned. There's expression of concern. We're, we're going to get back to you on this. We're going to do analysis. Okay. Um, and then June 13th, they retract it. Um, so now you look on, online and see it's retracted. I think that um, this is a great example of, of where preprinting would have helped. If, if, if this had been, if preprinting were required, for anything like this, if it were required, not, not allowed, but required, then people like the ones who were writing these blogs and statistical uh, you know, geeks and nerds who love to do this stuff, and some of my favorite people, they would have been the ones to catch this before. And then uh, you know, this is weaponized. People who really think the hydroxychloroquine is like the cure to COVID, um, they'll say, oh, look, the Lancet study was, that, that, that showed that it was harmful uh, was actually a fraud. And so this made us, this made the scientific community look very bad. So um, I think that, you know, those two examples, the sort of the pro and the con, both lean towards preprinting being a better idea. I want to end with, uh, sorry, my allergies are like hitting me here. <coughs> I want to end with um, kind of this idea that people have that preprinting could ruin your chances of getting published. And I really have struggled with this. And Harlan Krumholtz, you know, one of the founders of MedArchive, really helped me kind of see the light that it wouldn't. And I wanted to show you um, my own journey here. And uh, we, we pre-printed a bunch of stuff, but my, the, the first thing I think I pre-printed that ever got published was this one. And this is suicide deaths during the, the uh, shelter in place for stay at home period in Massachusetts. We pre-printed in October. And you know, there's the figure, which is sort of like suicide deaths by month, every month from 2015 up until the present. The gray zone is our sort of like area that we predict would be the normal. And uh, during the pandemic, and you could see that basically suicides didn't go down or up. They were sort of normal. Uh, we have a table. So then, you know, th two months later, you could see that we got this into JAMA Network. And basically, the only difference is that we added a month of data. Um, that's it. We look at like, what we gave them, which I call the MVP, the minimum viable product. And then two months later, or three months later, best available evidence, MVP or Bay. Um, and so that's really, you know, my first experience was, look, we could do this. It can be out there. The only downside 
of doing it this way was that when the when the study came out in January, it got a little less media attention than it did in October. The October media attention was huge. Actually, I got like the New York Times covered this study that we did. Uh, the Washington Post did it. I got to write an op-ed for the Post about it. It was really, it was like the, the rollout was big in October. In January, it landed, it was like, well, people are interested, but less so. So fine, but I'm not in it for that. I'm in it for getting the data out. So you have to kind of combine the two moments. So, you know, if you're worried about that aspect, but I, I don't think it's a big deal. Same thing true here. Mortality from external causes of death, injury, overdose, suicide during the pandemic in the whole United States. This data came out on February 12th. We pre-printed this on February 16th. And you can see that there's um, you know, five things we looked at. We looked at homicides, drug overdoses, accidents, motor vehicle crashes, and suicides. And these are our data. Of course, two months later, uh, it's in JAMA. And again, I'll send the same story. Here's the, um, here's the Met Archive. Here's the JAMA. The difference is the font and one month of data. So I think that um, you know, pre-printing in summary, you know, I think that in some cases pre-printing saved lives. I think that people started adopting DEX um, because they saw that the, the, these data were good. This was an established group, but even if it wasn't, they had great methods and they started adopting it. I think that pre-printing gives you that public peer review that would have saved a lot of embarrassment in the, in the uh, hydroxychloroquine surgisphere story. I think that someone, as someone has already said, it's anti-scoop. Like I worried about this idea of like scooping myself, but I'd rather be scooped by myself than scooped by somebody else. And lastly, the idea of you pre-print your minimum viable product, which is like as much data as you have. And then by the time you get to publication, you can give them the most, the best available evidence, the BAE. Um, and that's really the difference for me. And so that's been my story. I, um, and I'm happy to take questions. I hope that helps. Thank you, Dr. Foss. Thank you for joining us and thanks you for your great presentation. So we are going to continue our questions. Uh, I want to remind you, if you have questions, you can just post it in Zoom's chat box here at the bottom of your page. And you can also tweet us at Elife Community using hashtag ECR Wednesday. Um, great. We are going to continue. Uh, okay, we have another question. How much public commentary review did you receive on your preprint and incorporate in, into your revision during peer review? This is for, this is for me? Uh, yes, you or Dr. Matthews both are fine. Dr. Ross, you are okay to answer that as well. Go everyone. Uh, I mean, I can chime in. I mean, I think that a um, couple of things. I think that we did get some feedback that would, that helped. Um, it actually, <clears throat> most of the feedback that I got helped me prepare for more like public defense of the work, especially with the suicide story. People are really resistant to this idea that suicides didn't go up during the, the pandemic. They, they, they seem to, in a sick way, they want suicides to have gone up as some proof. That, that doing lockdowns is dangerous. I, I, it, it, I don't understand. I, I don't want suicides to go up. I want them to, to not change or go down. Um, that's what we found. That was good news. So I, it was, I think that the, um, the, um, uh, the feedback that, especially on preprints and, and, and then it goes on Twitter, gives you a sense of just what's going to be the uh, criticisms. And you can anticipate that a little bit in the writing, but more just in how you frame it for um, the public when you do the rollout. But one thing I'll say is, the um, ironically, the preprint experience has actually underscored for me good things about continuing on and doing peer review, because in every case, well, not every case, in in in, in some of the cases, despite the fact that we preprinted it and, and people it went viral or whatever, people looked at it. We had, we actually got really good comments during peer review. So I don't want to say that peer review is dead. It's not at all. In fact, my first JAMA paper, which I didn't show here, um, we preprinted is quite different. Not because the data are different, because but the, the the referees really wanted to help us frame it in a different way or, or a more useful way, and so the data are the same, but the presentation is quite different, um, and what we chose to share was different. So actually, it's funny. It, it, the preprinting to me um, both uh, underscores the importance of getting information out early, but also ratifies that there is still something, something positive to be gained from the um, peer review experience because we've had manuscripts that have gotten a lot better. Um, not the facts didn't change, but the manuscripts did. Yeah, I, 
Sorry, I was just I was I was going to agree with some of that. I mean, I think we've we've definitely had um, a variety of comments back, mostly um, kind of small technical changes. So not th again, not things that have kind of changed the overall message or or changed the results, but um, technical comments have been helpful um, in in shaping a manuscript. The other thing that I would say is I had a piece of work that I, when I was kind of early early in independence, which never managed to reach it into a peer reviewed journal. It was a retrospective look at some hospital data and there were some holes in it. And so it was difficult to kind of get into a peer reviewed journal. The peer reviewers kind of tore shreds in it and uh, we didn't get it into peer review, but actually having it on a preprint server has meant the data are useful. Other people have picked them up and co contacted me about them and said, oh, you know, we're interested in the same thing and our data have also got problems. and putting this together when you've got a relatively um, rare disease or condition and you're looking back retrospectively, there are kind of inevitably methodological issues which can be really difficult. But by putting your putting our work there on a preprint server, we actually kind of started a dialogue with various other people. And that was probably, it was a good few years ago and I've, I'm still contacted every so often by people who are kind of interested in that. And so I think that shows as well how you can kind of you know, your work can have benefit without necessarily getting into a conventional um, peer reviewed journal. So that that was another kind of very positive um, att attribute really or outcome for me. Great. Um, thank you. Our next question. Um, Dr. Fast, you have appeared on many news channels during the past year. Do you have any consideration in discussing results of preprint compared to peer reviewed article? I used to, <laughs> I definitely used to be very nervous about that. And I have never once regretted saying something that was pre-printed, but I have regretted the opposite that I allowed myself to get scooped on a number of things. I had really, Harlan Kremlitz and I have really beautiful data that we still haven't even pre-printed because the modelers won't let us. But, um, but I think it's the strongest compelling argument showing that indoor dieting drives outbreaks. Like, I think we have the best data for that. And I, I kept holding, kept holding, kept holding. I should have pre-printed it. I should have talked about it in public because by the time all the crappy data came out to show the same thing, we had nothing to add other than we, we know what, 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 to say, what you're saying is true, but here's a better proof of that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I've i never once regretted uh, talking about preprint. I mean, I certainly frame it that way. I always say, my colleagues and I have uh, published a manuscript that's on a preprint server. It hasn't been peer reviewed. so. Take that with a grain of salt, but here's what here's the data that we found. It's from the CDC. It's from here, um, and so I just frame it that way. So I uh, I am learning by experience to not keep making the same mistake. I, I need to, to stop holding back because the data are the data. So I, I only regret not being more of a convert sooner. Thank you, um, Dr. Ross and other panelists. Uh, do you think NIH? Uh, pilot a preprint project had influenced the trends in submission to preprint servers? Well, you know, I think two things that NIH did uh, specifically supported the use of preprints. First of all, several years ago now, they said that they would ex allow preprints to be cited in grant uh, submissions, which is critically important, particularly for early stage investigators whose work is just getting off the ground to be able to provide a citation to your work that may not yet have been published that supports uh, the work you're proposing to do. And obviously there, that was more in the concept of basic sciences, but it applies in clinical and health sciences as well. And when, uh, during COVID, when NIH launched their pilot to now PubMed index uh, preprints from certain servers, it again gave it, uh, you know, greater authority or I don't know, made people believe that it really is uh, the path of the future. So they, they conferred their sort of external heft on it. So I was delighted to see both steps forward. So. Thank you. Um, Dr. Matthews, can I ask questions from you? Uh, do you think there is a difference between clinician and other scientists in approaching to post their uh, work as a preprint? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think it's been really nicely um, covered by both actually Joe and Jeremy's um, presentations, just this kind of um, discussion and careful thought around um, 
you know how what what and how we share clinical data and when in the in the publication process but you know actually what's happening and and what we've seen great examples of is the whole scientific community engaging in peer review and isn't that a kind of way better and way more and way more robust um kind of approach than sending it out to two or three people stochastically who you know may have the right or not so right expertise or they may have other you know agendas they may have other sets of beliefs so actually putting something out in the public domain i think as clinicians we've learned and and absolutely epitomized as, as we've seen by by the pandemic situation we've really learned about the value of, of sharing and getting that kind of real-time feedback and so i would i my experience is that in the last five years the the ground has totally moved from people being really very cautious and hesitant and uncertain about doing this to just seeing it as part of the normal process to to publishing and and i now don't see that there's a divide between um clinical publications and non-clinical work um certainly not from from where i'm sitting oh thank you dr mattis uh we are just about to a time so we are we have to finish our webinar now uh we have we received some other questions that we couldn't ask you you can post your question at Eli community uh, at Twitter using ECR Wednesday hashtag. We can continue the discussion there. And if you enjoy today's webinar, the next ECR Wednesday webinar will be announced soon. And we hope you join us then. But for now, I would like to say thank you to our speakers and to everyone who tuned in today and contributed to the discussion. Thank you so much. And have a great day.